Mr. Chair, thank you very much and uh, appreciate this committee coming together to have what is a very important conversation on the Chinese Communist Party's not only takeover, but crackdown with this national security law that they've placed in Hong Kong. First of all, I want to begin, Mr. Lei, thank you so much for spending time with us today, for the sacrifice that your family has made, for the imprisonment of your father today, for speaking, for being a voice for the people of Hong Kong, for practicing his faith. He now, um, as you highlighted, in turn, with very little extrajudicial capability to be able to appeal this. We here in the United States stand with you in unwavering support um, to the rule of law, to the right of free expression, to the support of democracy in the face of adversity. Look, I'm from a small state of Iowa, and if you, we were to look at what Hong Kong went through in almost an overnight experience, the capturing of seven million lives and taking away those fundamental things that here in America Jefferson highlighted as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and muzzled in an instant. It would be the equivalent of Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, all in the case of an evening being transitioned from being a bastion of hope, a place that Asia could look to for freedom, for a voice, for a rule of law, both in its judges, but also in an exemplary police force that has now been used as a baton to crack down on individuals who have stood up. I mentioned those states in the heart of the heartland because, as Mr. Kern just highlighted, they were the states to help stand up and fight back against China's repression. When we took a personal hit in Iowa by doing trade negotiations, it meant that our farmers didn't get to sell pork and soybean to a very lucrative market. But it was far more important that we stood up to China now than afford them the ability to continue to bully not just their neighbors, but the entire world. The people of Hong Kong are proven friends, and it's clear today with so many of you here how important this is to your families and to the future of your families. As trade partners, as allies with the United States, you deserve to enjoy this fundamental right that we've experienced here in the West. But what the Chinese Communist Party has done by implementing its national security law in Hong Kong has effectively crushed not just the freedom, but it's punished individual expression, it's destroyed civil liberties, and it's taken away the promise that was made that these individuals would have the opportunity to have a fair and autonomous life. Overnight, the CCP betrayed not just the people of Hong Kong, but it lied bold face to the rest of the world in its ambition. It is difficult to work with partners that we want to find an on-ramp with, like China. But when they tell the United States to our face that they're not finding surveillance balloons over the West Coast, that they're not actively looking to arm, that they're not intrinsically suppressing their own people, I can only imagine the difficulty for those in Hong Kong today to be able to trust their own government. So with that, Mr. Le a, I'd like to begin with you. Due to the mass crackdown of civil liberties um, and the people of Hong Kong who are fleeing their home country today, as many we see in this room, in what ways can the United States create really a more welcoming place for these individuals to call home? We've learned not just sanctions are effective, but that there can be a carrot on this opportunity. Maybe as what was highlighted from the British visa plan to help those, particularly those intellectuals who want to leave Hong Kong, find a new home in America. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, look, the, the people of Hong Kong are, um, are a incredibly well-educated, uh, bilingual or trilingual, uh, labor force. So, so, so really, they, they are an asset to, to to any country that can 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 get enough of them in. And so, I think you know, as, as you alluded to, a a, a easier um, visa requirement. Now, I, I, it's not my area of expertise, but a easier visa requirement for for especially for those who are politically. Um, uh, persecuted, but for all those who 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 want to leave uh, in the uh, to the U.S. and and many of them want to move to the U.S. because I think fundamentally with how the U.S. has uh, uh, treated this case, there 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 is uh, much love for, for the U.S. in 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 Hong Kong, especially among those who who love freedom, which is I think most people. <laughs> um, so 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 that's um, or 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 I, I I know to say on this, but yeah, thank you.
No, and Mr. Lee, I think one of the key aspects of this is for those who have made it to the West to continue to be a voice for those who remain behind, to be a, a clear channel of information, being able to describe what's happening in Hong Kong today under this national security apparatus that's really enslaving its own community. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Kawak, we'd like to speak to you on this, you know, call it propaganda, call it dangerous doublespeak coming out of China today. The reality is, as a military member who's served counterintelligence operations inside China, you see a very different speak on what is said to the West and then what is done inside China. Um, specifically, the CCP has become a master of rhetorical influence, and they're doing this in a variety of mediums. Can you please share with us from your experience some of the ways the Communist Party has really promoted a pro-authoritarian uh, narrative that's influencing even some within Hong Kong to be subvertive to Beijing and willfully give up their own rights? Thank you for the question. I think um, you're right that the Chinese Communist Party is certainly expert uh, in really mending people's mind and creating different languages to cater to different audience. And from my time in the United States, I've observed that uh, the CCP has done so in Amer on American soil as well. Uh, for example, firstly, through uh, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices, uh, which have offices in D.C., New York City, and San Francisco, they consistently organize events with civil society partners, art galleries, you know, film festivals, uh, to talk about the story of Hong Kong. But of course, the kind of story they're talking about is a prosperous Hong Kong that never had any human rights abuses, and we know is not true. But for some American uh, members of the public who just want to watch a film, they would not understand you know, the very complex uh, dynamics behind, and they would easily absorb the rhetoric that uh, Hong Kong is back to business, while in fact it is not. And secondly, I think uh, one thing that has been getting more traction in Congress and in uh, general public is about TikTok. TikTok has been proven uh, to have uh, uh, a way uh, for people or staff members in mainland China to access uh, and also manipulate the algorithm uh, for the version in the United States. And that is definitely something to look out for because that is what uh, the CCP thrives at doing, is having all these subtle traces and subtle ways to really plant people's uh, uh, plant ideas into people's mind that are uh, useful or uh, uh, manipulative uh, enough uh, to support the regime. And that have been happening in Hong Kong for the past 26 years uh, with national education, patriotic education. Uh, a lot of propaganda materials have been used in kindergarten and primary schools to kids to tell them to love China. I exactly went through that sort of education, but not as much or as serious or as intense as kids in Hong Kong right now. And that is why it's also important to keep free internet open, uh, access open in Hong Kong, even though right now there's virtually a firewall uh, inside of Hong Kong. Uh, for example, uh, HADC's website is blocked in Hong Kong and censored. Um, but still, I think the Hong Kong government does not dare to really have a full firewall built up as it is in the mainland China right now. But even with that, they're blocking websites arbitrarily, one by one every day. And what we can do is, um, uh, previously, there was a bill in Congress on keeping uh, Hong Kong's internet freedom uh, safe and free for Hong Kongers to access. And uh, I urge the Congress to reconsider that kind of uh, legislation and see how we can keep internet access open in Hong Kong. And that is the only space Hong Kongers have right now to continue engaging in a discussion uh, on freedom and democracy. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Kwok, and thank you for advocacy on this very, very important issue. Mr. Kwok, I'm going to turn to you uh, briefly here. You know. We look at what's going on in the rest of the world right now. We see crackdowns in Iran. We see a repressive state, not just in Russia, but in Eastern Europe. These have been very in our face, physical military operations almost. In China, they're approaching it in a different path, but clearly with very similar effect. Hong Kong, the perfect example, the threat to Taiwan, very obvious to anyone who's watching right now. Could you deep dive with us briefly on the things that Beijing has done to effectively subjugate Hong Kong in such a short period of time um, that has really ripped away some of these fundamental freedoms that were enjoyed for decades prior to this with really not a shot even being fired, but almost more effective than what we're seeing in other repressive regimes. 
Um, when you need to shoot your own people, it's a sign you've failed. Uh, that, I think, is a Communist Party dictate. You know, one of the things about the Communist Party is that it's so strong that it doesn't often need to go out in the streets and shoot its own people. The last time uh, it did that in very large numbers was 1989 at the Tiananmen massacre. And I think that was one of the things the party learned was do everything you can so as to not have to resort to that. So what you see in Hong Kong is that they turn the screws as they need to. They imposed the national security law. They um, they arrested a lot of people. They waited to see what followed. They were disappointed that not enough Hong Kong people stopped speaking, stopped saying what uh, they didn't want to hear. And so they drug out this old colonial era from the UK colonial period, sedition law. Now, I don't know what sedition means to you, but in Hong Kong, it's basically a speech crime. So there was reference today to these five young trade unionists who published uh, three allegorical children's books about sheep. Uh, they were arrested and tried under sedition and sentenced to 19 months in prison each. Um, so there have been 77 arrests on sedition charges now. Um, uh, Jimmy Lai is also going to be tried on sedition as well as under the, the national security law. And the I think virtually all of these people, it's because they were journalists. There are two um, editors from a very respected uh, uh, publication that also has been forced to close like Apple Daily called Stan News. They're both on trial for... Uh, sedition. Um, many people who are on trial for sedition, it's for online comments they've made on social media. So that's what I mean. They they turn that screw and they look around and they say, have enough people be, been silenced? Are we satisfied? If not, then they find other uh, screws to to turn. Uh, and their objective is to silence people because propaganda really isn't very effective unless it's accompanied by censorship. Um, if people uh, have the right to say what they think, you've got uh, competing voices and it's very hard for propaganda to win out at the end of the day. Um, in China, they've really perfected that combination of propaganda and censorship. Uh, and in Hong Kong, they're trying to find exactly what the right mix is so that essentially they can turn it into to China. Imagine a situation in which George Orwell is arrested for writing Animal Farm. Unfortunately, it sounds like in Hong Kong today, fiction is now fact. And that's exactly what we see. These individuals who are trying to illustrate the challenge are now becoming the victim of a police state. I want to thank you all very much for your testimony today and know that you have a strong ally on a bipartisan, unit, a bicameral effort to be able to stand with Hong Kong and the work that you're trying to do to stand up to the CCP. Mr. Chair, I cannot thank you enough for leading <clears throat> this effort. Thank you thank so you. much.